yeah, I want to thank you all for, for uh, joining us here as well. Uh, when you could be with puppies, you decided to spend the time with us, so I'm feeling very uh, honored by that. Um, great panel. You see our names. You see our company affiliations. I know you've got the bios in the app, so we want to get right into this because this is such a rich topic. But the main thing that I do want you to know about this group, what I'm really excited about, is we've got a group here that represents a lot of different pieces of this ecosystem of new ways we can measure television and connected TVs. So we're going to talk about this from a bunch of different angles, uh, both from the audience measurement side of things, like who, how do we know who we're reaching when we're placing our ads across all these different things. And then as well, well, how do we know if it worked, and how do we get beyond the traditional measures of what works on TV and get down to you know, the dollars and cents, the really good stuff. Um, so let me start uh, our panel off here. And oh, by the way, of course, you all have your app open, so you're going to send us great questions. We've got a long list of stuff that we want to talk about, but really this is about what you need to hear. So I'll be keeping an eye on this, so send in questions uh, as they come up. But uh, anyway, let's start by just talking about, you know, this is going to be a very different world for television measurement with all these new different kind of data sources. Um, give us an idea of both kind of the big picture of where you see it going, but also where each of you kind of fits into it and how you're going to contribute to that. Sean, we'll just go down the line here, start with you. All right, sounds good. So uh, Sean Mueller, CEO of iSpot. Uh, one of the things that uh, we help uh, advertisers do in the marketplace is bring their TV measurement uh, in-house and sort of modernize their TV measurement from a digital-like compression measurement, attention measurement, and business outcome-based uh, measurement. So a lot of the changes that we see happening is this rapid shift in the marketplace from advertisers buying based on age and gender uh, for TV to now creating a whole slew of solutions that really focus on business outcomes. And how do you buy television based on business outcomes? How do you optimize it based on business outcomes? Great. Yeah. Uh, Sandeep Millar, I run the ad solutions team. And I'm com like we are coming at it from an angle of you now Visa is the largest payment provider. And we have an obligation to kind of help both our clients and consumers. So if we think of our clients, we think of both our issuing clients, which are our banks, but also our merchants, right? And where they are going is they're thinking about, you know, how do I engage my audience on TV broader than just reaching them, which is, you know, I just don't care about pure eyeballs alone. Back to your point of how do I drive business outcomes? Business outcomes are if I'm a burger giant, I need to sell burgers. Right? I'm not in the, in the business of um, you know, getting paid based on likes or tweets or you know, uh, shares. So if, if you take that notion, what my job and my team's job is to help connect those dots, both from a reach perspective, so we can help you reach people who are likely to spend and are spending in your category, and then how well is your uh, messaging working to kind of close that loop, all in the, in the safeguard of, privacy compliant and not at the, the sense of like, we will never right, compromise um, you know, our, our data set, but we want to help drive commerce. So that's, that's where we are coming from and trying to help both TV and digital. For us, the, the channel essentially doesn't matter. We want it to mm -hmm. drive your overall strategy and channel is a way to get there. Great. Shane, you use a lot of this data and you're really on the advertiser side trying to help them make sense of it, right? <laughs> yeah, so in an omni-channel partial attribution world, really breaking down really channels themselves and really looking for outcomes, what is the most effective in an unbiased data set world, really looking at the best data sets that are available to get you to those outcomes by putting the person at the centric and making decisions around that. What was effective to get to your end KPI, whether, whatever that may be, maybe a sale, maybe a website visit, maybe a dealership visit, et cetera, but looking at the deterministic data sets on the market, then applying modeling to that to get to the best outcomes based off of what's available today is really the way of looking at it where there isn't kind of predetermined bias built in because I'm on the digital team or I'm on the TV team or the direct team or on the partner brand side, just saying this is effective, this isn't effective. Cool. Uh, from my side, I focus primarily around enablement uh, of analytics audience creation, targeting. And so my team has been really focused on developing in-house capabilities to answer a lot of the measurement questions that we do have. Uh, so we've been focusing primarily for the past couple of years uh, thinking about audiences and traditional digital. We've pretty much solved for that. 
uh, and now focusing on other areas, TV is kind of the next frontier. Cool, cool. Well, let me stick with you, Jess, on this, because one of the questions I'm getting a lot about all these great new data sets, um, the advantages they have, particularly if it's like ACR data sure. tracked on the TV, you know, so much bigger than the Nielsen panel, really down, really granular kind of data, not just sort of general data, but, you know, love or hate Nielsen, the one thing you have to credit them with is they work really, really hard to make sure that panel is representative. And there's a lot of variables here with the, the kind of data TV, do people opt in, you know, other variables that go into it. So, you know, yeah. how, how, how should marketers think about the representativeness of this data set or how to work with it in an appropriate way? I mean, we struggle with this quite a bit uh, across our different product lines. So what we need to do for our mobile phones versus smart TV versus appliances is, is very different. Uh, yeah. We, as we look to in-house, either the knowledge mm -hmm. or just pure raw firehose data, um, is making sure that it meets Samsung's needs. Off the shelf really doesn't work for us anymore. Mm -hmm. And in some cases we need to tweak things to meet our needs. In other cases, we need to build it from scratch. Uh, so we've been taking kind of a, a very specific ad hoc approach to the particular line of business that we're supporting and the individual KPIs that are either we're trying to drive or measure. Um, uh, we don't have a clear answer, sadly. Yeah. yeah. So uh, I would, I'd follow up on that. So I think you basically described the difference between measurement and data, really, because Nielsen is measurement, right? Because now we can, we can all argue whether they're measuring the right thing or if you know, how accurate it is, but it is, it is a measurement system because it is scalable, it's consistent, it's predictable. And so what's going on in the market today, you got all these data sets that are available, whether they're set-top box data or, or smart TV, ACR data, but none of these data sets are measure, what we call measurement grade, really. Most of them are not measurement grade because you have to invest a lot in take, taking a data set and making it accurate, making it representative, uh, and, and really, you can't do that with a data set unless you actually build a product around it uh, that has some marketplace acceptance, uh, that people use and validate. And also, these data sets all have to be aligned with the currency data. So today, most of the rawish data sets uh, that, that are out there really are very, very raw data sets. So what we've invested in at iSpot over the last five years is transforming these types of data sets into measurement grade that are accurate, consistent, scalable, predictable, and also have alignment with, with the Nielsen data, because Nielsen is the currency, and that is the measurement grade currency uh, today. So having that alignment is really, really important. So, so as we talk about all these measurement mm -hmm. solutions and data lakes, it's really important to validate the inputs, because right, if, if you're putting a raw data set in that hasn't gone through this, and whatever else you're building on top of it is maybe a waste of time. Yeah, Shane, I see you leaning forward yeah. there. <laughs> yeah, I think there, when you think of representative, I think there's two sides, representative of the channel itself and representative of your customer base, right? And uh, to Sean's point, right, data in that's garbage is gonna re result in garbage out, right? So that's kind of the first part is, is the data valid? Um, is it accurate? then is it representative of the channel? Then is it representative of our customer base or kind of the checks that you wanna go through as you're thinking of ingesting any data source and especially when you start talking about combining data sources for the same channel, right? So whether that's TV or digital, the different sources that come in, when you start to take data set A and data set B to actually broaden your reach and representativeness, those inherently are gonna be very different based off of the formats. So you're getting a like to like for that it is a very, very complex process. And as we talked about backstage, most companies now have invested heavily in their data science team that are building out these data lakes where they're just taking in tons of data, taking in tons of data to, to, what, to really what is the outcome, right? I would say tackle the problem from the exact opposite, which is what are you trying to solve for? What data do you need to solve for it? And then is this data source valid? Is it representative for the channel? Is it representative for my customer base? And, and I think we talked about data lake being a septic tank. Yes. <laughs> to actually like cleanse it and make sure that you, you can actually derive some, some good insight yeah. out of it. Yeah, well, let, me, let me dig one layer deeper then on that question because that, that data hygiene question comes up all the time. So as a, but particularly from the marketer side, you're not really involved in that. What, what are the sort of insightful questions you should be asking about uh, either from the data provider or whoever is prepping the data for you to know that, you know, at least 
you know, no data set's perfect, but to know, you know, what are the potential uh, biases in it so that you can use it and apply it appropriately. Um, we, I mean, I don't think, I think it depends on this category of data, but I mean, we generally look at a couple different factors. So one is uh, scalability, right? If this is, you know, if we're marketing to 50 million people and you can only help match or tell us about 100, you know, you're kind of, not, I don't care how accurate you are, <laughs> it's not really valuable to me. Um, you know, the other is how accurate are you? You know, how real time, how, you know, there's, a checklist of sorts that we do go through to try to put people kind of through the ringer to make sure that it meets our needs. Yeah. And, yeah. and the most important part is, can you answer the question we're trying to solve? Because mm. as most data providers, you know, there's a hell of a lot of data, but if only, you know, there, there may be only one data point that's actually valuable to us. And is that worth dealing with all the work that needs to go to pull that one thing out? Yeah, then I think there's the basics, right? So, you know, is it married? Is it male, female, gender? What does that actually look like against your own data set? And then actually modeling for that, right? So some data set uh, may skew heavy, heavy towards married, but your individual customer base is not. So therefore, within the modeling itself, you've got to actually um, account for that. Yeah, that's maybe you, you test it with the truth set and make sure that it's accurate, but then you go back and check every few often, right? Because data is not stagnant and there's, there's no, it's going to it's going to get stale. It's going to it's going to the road. So we want to make sure that you check the 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 validity of it every few months. Yeah, and, and I would add, I, I think there's a few simple steps, and I think this is really important to do before bringing a data set in because it's not it's not that much work to validate it up front, uh, and it's something that everybody should do. So if you're talking about let's say a TV data set, uh, and let's say uh, your Visa or, or or Samsung, the first question you should ask is show me. Show me my own ads, uh, uh, impressions, and, and GRP and TRP equivalents for the, last, for the last month, and have your media team validate that. And if, if, if the data source can't provide you with, with that data, right off the bat, you'll probably eliminate about 80% of data sources right there, <laughs> <laughs> no matter how pretty their PowerPoint slides are. So, so I, I would say that's, that's the number one key, is make sure that you get your own data compared to the truth set. Uh, have your media teams do that because they know how they buy media, especially on TV. So don't don't have your data scientists sort of decide. Kind of have have your media teams uh, really uh, really look at that. And then I would ask your data source uh, what products have been built around that data. Can you actually log into a dashboard and look at some of these outputs, or is this just a data stream that's coming directly from who knows where? Uh, and then your data lake turns into uh, a sewage treatment plan, as you alluded to. <laughs> uh, so, so I think these are just some basic things. And we've seen a lot of folks make mistakes by not even looking at these, these very, very simple things. And in terms of representation, first and foremost, it's got to be representative of the, of the US television viewing population. And then it's got to have enough scale in it uh, to then also have representation of whatever the customer uh, the customer segment is. So all these things are important. Uh, and you know, uh, Jesse, I, I would probably turn it around. I would start with accuracy first and scale second. I think you, you look at scale yeah, well, first, but uh, I think that's debatable. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, let me follow up one other question there because you gave us a good tip there. Uh, and Xandeep, you talked about the truth set. So one truth set is you know, do that backward look at your media plan, have the media team validate it. What other you know, kind of interesting uh, good ways to get a truth set are, are you familiar with or that you've used? Sorry, I mean, uh, Anyone. Yeah. You, you uh, can take a sample, yeah. right? Yeah. You can take a sample and then like, well, you can do a friends and family stuff. And, like, yeah. and say, hey, here's, here's, I know these people and this is, let's say the viewership or whatever it is and see if that shows up in the data set. Mm -hmm. right? like, yeah. That's an easy and quick and dirty way to do mm -hmm. it. But, no, I'm not a data scientist. Yeah, sort of DMA story. test and control uh, is probably the most accurate. It's hard to do it channel specific, but a DMA is probably the most accurate way to do it. Yeah, I mean, I think another validation that's easy to do is scale. When it comes to scale, mm -hmm. uh, if you have your CRM uploaded through LiveRamp, just have LiveRamp tell you what is the overlap between a LiveRamp or iSpot or whatever data set you're you're looking at. Yeah. And so again, these are simple validations that you can do rather than. Uh, you know, relying on some pretty PowerPoint slide that somebody may, may put up. No, same, we, um, depending on the data set, we will validate it against our CRM data, yeah. known consumer opted-in information versus observed. 
Cool. Yeah, I mean, I'll try before you buy, right? <laughs> yeah, right, right. <laughs> Always. Good, great stuff. Now, one of the uh, 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 statements in the description here is measuring across TV and digital is possible. And I'll tell you, one of the number one questions I'm getting these days is uh, Nielsen, love it or hate it, is based on a panel, and that panel gets down to the individual who is viewing that program, whereas a lot of these data sets, if it's ACR on a TV or a set-top box of some sort, is really at the household level, not the individual level, and particularly as a planner who's trying to understand and measure what is the audience I'm going to reach, how do you reconcile that, the, those two different levels of granularity? So we uh, at Samsung, uh, depending on the line of business, you know, for mobile phones, we have to we have to invest in individual level information, and you know, both insights, engagement, and measurement solutions. Uh, when we think about TVs, appliances, we have to think about households, uh, and then obviously the holy grail is those two things stitched together. Um, we, I think we're we're in a progression right now. Again, over the past three years, the heavy investment has been an in individual. We've been able to kind of build out a very large addressable population of people that we can track and analyze as well as target, um, both prospecting and consumer, um, as well as then start thinking about primarily working with partners, but also thinking within the Samsung ecosystem uh, around what does a household look like and what does it mean? Um, because I may target you to buy a TV, but your kids may be watching or your wife may be watching. And so understanding the dynamics as well as the technical ability to stitch these things together to make sense of it because they don't perfectly align. Um, there's a lot of discrepancies right. when you really try to look at them together. So I think having the right data, having the right process, and the right, I guess, direction of what you're trying to achieve. Yeah, I would add, to, to get the true cross-channel measurement, you got to measure all the channels in a consistent way, right? So that's, mm -hmm. so that's step one. So today you've got this panel approach on, on the television side that looks at this thing called the GRP and a TRP, a really complex calculation. No, nobody, unless you're in TV, sort of can understand it. Uh, and then on, on digital, and then it's household-based, right? So then you, on digital you have a person-based uh, or device-based measurement uh, that is more impression-based. Uh, and, and view rate based. So step one in this whole journey, it, this whole thing is a journey, right? Nobody can sit here to tell you and tell you I can do true cross-channel measurement and I got it all figured out. That, that, that hasn't happened yet. Um, so the first step is to measure the channels consistently. So we, we think about measuring TV just like digital, right? So measuring device-based impressions, to, uh, measuring view rate. So that's, that's the first step and having a translation layer into the Nielsen currency. So that's step one. Step two, you got to figure out this household to, uh, to individual. And that really takes uh, sort of a device graph, if you'll right, of the device, devices that are in the home. Uh, the television devices map to uh, the digital devices that are in the home. And there's a whole slew. Samsung has its own digital device. iSpy has its own. Uh, obviously, LiveRamp and others have its own. Uh, and then you've got to synchronize those across the channels, right? So we've got to synchronize ours with LiveRamp and Oracle and Adobe and everybody else. And Samsung does, does the same thing. Uh, and now you're starting to get closer and closer to having consistency in, in the way that you plan, you buy, you optimize. But, but it's, a, it's a journey, right? So it, it, takes, it's, it takes time, and, and you've got, right, you got to make the right changes right now uh, to the measurement before you can think about truly unifying everything, even though I know everybody likes to talk about the unification. Yeah. Well, with that, we've got three great questions coming in, and this one ties right into your, your comments there, Sean. But well, what about partnerships? What stops the guys in this panel from working together? I mean, Visa and Samsung sound like a good partnership. So instead of leaving it to the individuals <laughs> to sort of figure out how to stitch stuff That's together, <laughs> <laughs> Look at this, we got a beginning of a beautiful friendship yeah. here. Awesome. That's how that works. Um, yeah, how can, we, how can we accelerate those, those kinds of partnerships? Uh, I mean, to my point earlier, is like, what are we trying to solve? We have a challenge because we, for the most part, don't really own point of sale. We're dependent on our carriers and retail partners. They don't want to share any data back with us. So we're constantly trying to figure out hacks yeah. to get around that. And how do we solve the traditional question of ROI of our marketing efforts. Yeah, so motivations have to align, right? Yeah, yeah. So that's, that's where 
if it's a Samsung working with Target, working with us to be able to triangulate and talk about what's good for Samsung is also good for Target, yep. right? And you're gonna bring not just your, you're not just asking for data, you're asking it for a specific reason. The reason is I wanna sell more TVs. You sell TVs, so make the connection, right? Versus talking about media right. and you know, GRPs, they all matter at the end of the day. We all get paid if you work at a, you know, a burger joint for selling burgers. You work at a TV for selling TVs, not eyeballs or views, right? So that's, that's important. And aligning those objectives to say, to target, it's about meeting your goals, and here's how we can meet those goals. So I've been talking to a, a big CPG brand because Visa doesn't see what you bought, right? We know you went to target and you bought a certain, you know, you went at this time and you bought, you know, for this amount, but we don't know what you bought. So, but we can work with the CPG brand and bring a partner, for example, like a Costco or Target to the table to talk about how we can drive commerce using, you know, maybe card linked offers as a way to do that. And then using our measurement to see that your, your marketing message is resonating and driving business outcomes. Yeah, and I think the, the data privacy aspect of it is really the, the huge reason why you don't see synergies across the industry, right? Nobody wants their data to leave a firewall. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, clean rooms and safe, safe harbors, things like that that are coming together and getting industry standards is going to be a big deal. So we can get yeah. consistency across because that's really the big crutch with all of it, right? So the clean rooms want you to put their, your data in their environment. They don't want their data to leave their environment. And you get in this chicken or the egg thing and then you basically get into paralysis and no one does anything. So it's really working with the best that's available and then the synergies there. And I think the brands have a lot more power than, than I think uh, given credit for. We've seen a lot of our clients be able to get impression level data, get click data from what would be considered walled gardens that haven't given it out before, simply based off of what they spend with them. So what client A can do doesn't necessarily mean client B can do it because a lot of it's in your buying power itself. Um, and then coming up with actually solutions so kind of poison pills where I can take your data, put it in an environment, run analytics on it, and then kill all the data that I brought in there, right? So th there are solutions that are being brought to the table now, but in, in fairness, it's still years away from where it needs to be. You're seeing a lot of talk of these, but these are concepts that don't really exist in a true complex um, attribution world. Very, very simple equations like joins you can do. Right. It, that's about it. And that's just simply not good enough in this day and age because you're simply just doing a you know, A equals B, but that's not the case in a, in a partial attribution world. It simply is much, much, much more complex than that. Yeah, yeah. Um, we've got one clarifying question coming in, and this is gonna lead into a question for you, Sandeep. Um, what do we mean by outcomes? We're throwing that word around a lot. Mm -hmm. What do you mean by outcomes? Meaning what you get paid for, mm -hmm. right? Which is, what is your purpose in terms of working as a business, right? You're selling a service, a product, so think of that outcome and everybody within the company needs to align to that. Whether you're yep. marketing, it shouldn't be that I need to you know, uh, spend a million dollars. Million dollars to do what? Yep. Right? So it's, in my mind, it's pretty simple. Yep. So if you're Visa, we need to get more Visa cards into people's hands and have them spend on digital payments, right? That's our goal to be everywhere you know, that you as a consumer want to be and enable electronic payments, but it yeah. should be pretty simple. What's the goal of your media is the simplest way to look at yeah. it. Why are you advertising? Why are you spending money? Media is not the goal. goal. <laughs> yeah, your goal is either trying to drive people to websites, so they fill out a form, from them to buy something, whatever it may be. What is the purpose of your media? When you get into more complex things and you see a lot of shift in the industry that has gone towards more um, attitudinal or branding aspects, which have a longer term funnel, and that becomes more complex. So was I able to shift awareness or favorability towards a brand? And you saw that really the last five years come back. It had been abandoned for a while. It was all about, because digital had taken over, it's all about conversion. Every marketing team was, was measured on kind of that, that last click, that end action, whether whatever the channel was. You're seeing a lot of uh, marketers go back to a long-term branding and looking at that overall funnel of, first they have to be aware of my brand, then they have to fa have a favorability towards my brand, then we actually get to an outcome where they're willing to purchase it. Because if those top things aren't there, they're simply never gonna buy from you if they already have an unfavorable um, aspect about you. And really linking 
upper funnel metrics to lower funnel metrics is extremely important when you think about your measurement. It's something that doesn't get thought about, mostly because they're different departments, right? You have a brand department that does some brand tracker, and anyone ever seen a brand <coughs> tracker, it's a straight line that never actually really moves. It's not actionable. But if you can take that brand tracker and break it down to an individual level, then apply impression level data back onto it, I can see in a long-term funnel how my upper funnel media actually affect the downstream conversions. So that's a, a, another question that came in about how do you reconcile these short-term optimization metrics with particularly if you're in a category where that, that sales effect may be longer term. Um, and you touched on it, but Shane, I'm gonna push you to go a little bit deeper because uh, that's what you guys do. Yeah, yeah, so I mean, one of the things that, you know, we work with partners to enable measurement for, uh, we look at our services on behalf of our clients, right? Because we sit on this data set, which is enormous, and we are the largest payment processor. So it's not good enough to get your measurement two months, three months post. Like, what are you doing? What, what are you going to do with that information? Like, that happened versus being able to get um, a sense for what creatives are resonating with the client more easy, like, probably a week, two weeks, right? That's a lot more impactful because you can switch things out. The cost of, of no, trying and tr trial and, and error is low, so you, you should be able to like try a bunch of these things and get feedback within a matter of days. Now it's a matter, like I've seen people say, I would love to do that, right? But when I go talk to brands and agencies, like, yeah, but who's gonna do that? <laughs> so th they struggle with the, the aspect of not just optimization, everybody wants to do optimization, but I think mm -hmm. a lot of people don't put the effort to think about, okay, who's gonna be in charge of switching things out, making decisions, versus they're all attuned to going three months later to their CMO or the CFO and saying this happened or this didn't work, right? Yeah, and I think that's the difference between measurement and optimization, right? So measurement's telling you, and our chief data scientist tell you, the fish you already caught, versus are you a good fisherman to begin with? Mm -hmm. And really the answer is that you should wanna know, right? From a CFO perspective, yeah, in a traditional MMM you wanna say, here my marketing was effective, here's how many fish we caught with my marketing. In this day and age, what you really wanna do, to your point is, I'm gonna put the right creative in front of the right people through the right channel. If you think of those as kind of the, what's my target, what's my message, and what's the channel. If I change any one of those variables, I will get a different outcome. Yeah. How can I get these better outcomes and more effectively spend my media dollars is ultimately where you should be going, what you should be thinking about the end game rather than looking at everything in the rear view mirror. You, you should be trying hundreds of tests. Yeah. Right? But I, I think the question is more around how do you balance the short term uh, and longer term impact when you're doing this yeah. business outcome measurement. And I, I think this is where you have to, to really think through how you build up the analytics and the measurement. Because uh, certain things you want to have you want to have shorter term attribution windows and lift windows to look at the impact. I think auto is a great example, right? We all know tier one, tier two. Tier one is branding. Tier two is meant to go have you go buy the vehicle this weekend, right? So when you think about a promotional campaign that's meant you to, to go buy a product, you typically want to look at shorter attribution windows, whether they're seven day attribution windows. And as we think about the branding campaigns, uh, certainly longer attribution uh, uh, windows work, 30, 60. And then if you want to look at really, really long-term impact, to Shane's point earlier, there's always, you, you got to look at the upper funnel sort of uh, brand recall uh, uh, t type of. Especially type in of automotive brand. when you have a three-year consideration window, right? No yeah. one saw a 0% financing ad and said, I'm going go, to go buy a Porsche today, right? You're either yeah. in the market for that class, you, had a, you were willing to spend that kind of money before that last touch is really the conversion. That's why you see such an over-optimization really solely in digital because it has been the channel that has been easy to optimize. So it's been optimizing to itself over and over and pretending like it's its own channel and nothing else you do affects that channel whatsoever. So that's, and again, most of the marketing departments, their, their incentives have been so swayed and geared towards that that it's really caused the lack of branding, the lack of really looking at um, upper funnel, middle funnel metrics to get down there, which you're now seeing that kind of bounce back because everyone realizes that, sure, there's certain industries where it's simply just a straight conversion, where I'm just gonna go for the cheapest price or you know, I, it's a commodity, I'm gonna go buy this, but for most brands, it's a much more complex buying cycle than that, and certain mediums and channels are just better suited for 
education, then, la then conversion, and, and really getting that right mix is, is extremely important. But building on that, like for example, in autos, the, the actual business outcome, which is a sell of a vehicle, is too far down the line to actually really be able to isolate what media really, really drove that. So a lot of the autos kind of go up the funnel and look at demand generation, right? Am I genera generating demand to the, to, for this vehicle? Do consumers go to the website and configure the vehicle? Uh, and, and I think that's why I think whoever asked the business outcome question is, is a valid question because it's not always the sale. It really does depend on right. the industry and the product. Right, and that's uh, another question here. Thank you, Charlie, um, about this idea of outcomes as the successor to the old age gender you know, kind of measures. And Sundeep, you had mentioned engagement before. And I, I think you were touching on Yes, engagement may be a metric depending on your category, but not necessarily an end in itself because we do want to ultimately get to that link to that sale no matter how long yep. that yeah. takes. Yeah. So I guess the question, I'm going to push the question one level deeper because obviously the shorter term, the easier it is to get the number and to attach it to a specific exposure. But is there a way in which you can then uh, uh, use that as a proxy for you know, if we achieve a certain level of engagement or a certain yeah. level of the short-term metric that we can then say the long-term effect is going to be, you know, 1.5x or Yeah, your leading indicator is really, and again, that leading indicator is different for every industry, right? So my leading indicator may be a test drive in the car example. It may be a configuration on the website. But, you know, then it's using your own internal metrics of how many of those equal sales. Right. It's to really use as the proxy for it. And then ultimately, you need to go back and validate that. Because as you bring in new audiences and new demographics, that funnel may change rapidly depending on what you're attracting for it. So it may be fantastic at driving that middle funnel metric like a car configuration. But if none of those people ultimately convert, then what I'm getting is a lot of people are interested in building a cool car because they built a great configurator and they're never going to buy that right. car. So they do need to then understand, is this truly a leading indicator of sales? And do my assumptions hold true as I go back? So going back in a three month, six month window to validate that, whatever the length of the sales cycle is, is extremely important. So you can keep refreshing that data as opposed to this is what it was two years ago, this is what it's going to be now is, is really not going to work. Yeah, and by the way, all the automakers, sticking with the automakers, have <laughs> these numbers. Like they know that there's certain people that come to the website and configure vehicles. They know what that turns into yep. uh, in terms of sales. So they're actually optimizing their media to drive that because that sits ahead of when the vehicle purchases actually occur. So, and, and by the way, you shouldn't hold media companies account, accountable for anything but dri driving consumers to the front door. Because right. once they're in the front door, you may have just terrible vehicles, you may have a terrible website, you may have just really bad pricing, right? So, 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 so really, the, the line's got to be drawn somewhere when we think about moving the industry from age and gender to yeah. business outcomes. Yeah, and to get in, away in from that and give a simple retail, right? So if you think yeah. of like something like fast fashion where it's turning over so quickly, right? You're gonna need to look at like bounce rates, right? The media drove the website, but then they bounced really quickly when they hit the website because they weren't finding the products, it wasn't searchable, whatever it may be, that drove them away very quickly. So again, to, just because automotive is such a long, when you think of something that's constantly turning over, it's extremely important to know what those metrics of your business are because there's no measurement or data company's gonna help you with that. You need to understand what your business is and your consumers and then back into what we should be measuring and what those outcomes KPI should be. Yeah, I'm going to jump in here because we've got 30 seconds and I've nope. got one really, I think, good action-oriented question, which the audience is putting it on us here on the panel, but I think it's something all of us in the room need to think about. And the question is, set-top box data could have replaced Nielsen, but it never achieved scale or consistency. And what are you on the panel doing? And I would say, what, are, what should we be doing as an industry to ensure that these new data sets like ACR and connected TV aren't just more of these false starts? I, I think, we, you know, at Samsung, we are looking at multiple, you know, we have our own ACR data based off of our TVs. You know, we have 30 million mm -hmm. TVs that we're collecting this on, uh, independent of set-top and, and a variety of other things. So we're looking at that. Um, we are looking at partner data. You know, we are working with iSpot. Um, we are working with Nielsen. And so how do we bring this all together in a way that can make sense for us. Um, each one has its own pluses and minuses. They all tell slightly different stories. 
but how do we make sense of it? How do we stitch it together in a way that, again, meets our business needs? And I, I would add, the reason set-top-box data didn't replace the Nielsen data is there's no reason to replace the Nielsen measurement if you want to measure age and gender, <laughs> right. right? If you want to measure age and gender, Nielsen's just fine. Yeah. And so the set-top box, we're, trying, we're attempting to replace the wrong measurement metric, and that's why. Mm -hmm. and, and so the, the way we view it, and I think a lot of people in the, in the room would agree, is the industry needs a, a different metric, not the age and gender metric, and there needs to be a system developed that can consistently uh, and accurately uh, predict and, and, and measure this new metric. And, and, and so that's, th that's really why the set-top box data didn't replace Nielsen, because there was no reason to. Yeah, and that world's shrinking too. So yeah. right when we did replace it, it's getting smaller and smaller as we speak. Yeah. All right, awesome. Thank you all. Thank Great. you. Thank you all. Good session.